Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to, to see you today. You noted pastor said this is the lowest attendance of the year. This particular Sunday, you see who's preaching. <laughs> smart pastor. Calculating, but smart. Have you enjoyed the Olympics? Man, it's been extraordinary. Some unbelievable performances. Really makes you proud of our young people, some of them not so young, and I'm especially proud of them. And some of those uh, competitors, uh, even from this country, have come from the poorest circumstances and the most difficult backgrounds. And, and many of them have given expression to their faith. It's been delightful to hear that. They are being salt the salt of the earth, and I'd like to direct your attention to that text this morning, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew the fifth chapter, and we want to look at these words of Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Christ said, you are, and by the way, He most often talks about what we are far more than what we must do. Because what we do will flow out of what we are. He didn't even say, go and witness. He said, you shall be, you shall be my witnesses. And he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Well, it can't. And so it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, this is a, no, a different sermon, and I won't, I won't go too far. Just the next verse, though, I want you to see how it's interconnected. Christ says, you are the light of the world, and don't hide that light. Now, we want to talk to you this month about being witnesses for Christ. People who have a faith and share that faith. It's important for us to, un to understand that the Bible teaches, to whom much is given, much is required. Jesus said, as the Father hath sent me, even so send I you. He said, you shall be my witnesses. And our text today brings that kind of revelation you are the salt of the earth. Well, the greatest sermon ever preached was given to one of the smallest companies. I don't know about you, but uh, I had often pictured the Sermon on the Mount being delivered to a multitude of people enjoying the benefits of one of the master's teaching sessions. But the biblical account suggests a much smaller group. Chapter 5, of which we're in, verse 1 and verse 2 tells us, Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside to get away from those crowds. And he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So this message was specifically addressed to his disciples. First of all, I'd like for us to notice the word that is delivered. And that word is, you are the salt of the earth. Seven words. Extremely simple words. In fact, every one of them single-syllable words. This was a common term to talk about salt and common language, everyday language, and this is the way Jesus most often taught, using common everyday terminology. Think of it. He spoke of lights and doors and gates and sheep and coins and sons and seed and weddings and bread and water. He took the most common everyday items and used them to highlight the most important and eternal truths. He spoke in everyday language, 
the language of the people. No wonder, the Bible says, the common people heard him gladly. In using the analogy of salt, Jesus is using an incredibly common word. The disciples were very familiar with the importance and the function of salt, especially those fishermen in the group. Salt occupied a dominant place in their labors. It was one of society's most precious items. In fact, there was a proverb in that day that said, sun and salt were the two essentials for life. A common term, and yet he gives it a very uncommon application. How unlikely and unexpected and unbelievable these words must have sounded. You are the salt of the earth. Now, Jesus wasn't given to exaggeration or hyperbole, and He didn't make mistakes. Christ's calm assertion that the tiny group of disciples before Him, and remember, they are fishermen, they are tax collectors, they are men with runaway ambition and misguided zeal, men who are flawed and failure-prone, were the salt of the earth, must have sounded like, like a bad joke. It would be like someone saying of me, you are the mechanic of the world. There's an absurdity level to this statement that would make one question Jesus' judgment, if not His sanity. This little group had its problems. For one thing, they were little, just 12 men, and they had no standing, they had no power, they had no success to really talk about, they had no education, they had no money. But as unbelievable as Jesus' words might have seemed, they were true. So these words do not show a misguided mistake in Jesus, but as always, His words reveal His wisdom and His prophetic insight. You are the salt of the earth, and in every generation those words hold true. The Roman Empire will collapse under the weight of its own arrogance. Plato's academy will expire. The great library at Alexandria will be burned to the ground. The schools of the Stoics and Epicureans will fade off the scene. Even Jerusalem and its great temple will be destroyed. But this little group Christ calls the salt of the earth will survive and it will survive through the greatest persecutions known to mankind. It will entrench itself throughout the Greco-Roman world. It will penetrate Caesar's household. It will carry on throughout the ages. It will survive the test and tribulations internally and externally. It will survive the philosophies of atheism, communism, evolutionism, materialism, hedonism, and humanism. It will survive the theologies of paganism, pantheism, Gnosticism, docetism, and liberalism, and a whole bunch of other isms. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So the word Jesus spoke that day was a divine revelation, a truth so glorious, only history could reveal its glory. You are the salt of the earth. But secondly, in that word that was delivered, let's look at the wisdom that is delivered. Now, why salt? Of all the analogies, Christ could have selected, why did He choose salt? Well, of course, for one thing, salt was precious. In the ancient world, it was a precious commodity. The Greeks called it divine. Roman soldiers were often paid in salt. It was used in offerings to God. And until recently, quite recently, people in that part of the world would store seawater in great bins, and the sun would evaporate the water and leave the salt behind. 
The Romans regarded salt as a, a symbol of purity. They said that salt came from the purest of all things, the sun and the sea. Salt was an essential to life and thus cherished. Oh, what Jesus is seeing and saying when He delivers this message to His disciples, you are the salt of the earth. And of course, salt has always been one of the finest preservatives. It stops decay. I had farmers after the first service tell me they even use salt to preserve hay, something I was not aware of. It was especially used in such a capacity in, in Jesus' day. In a hot climate without Maytag or Amana, meat spoiled quickly. Salt was used to preserve it. So Jesus is saying His disciples are the preserving agents of society. They are the restraining force against decay. Society often resents the presence of the church, and would, some would even go so far to say it would be a better world without the church around. But oh, my friend, without the church, evil and corruption would destroy society. The light would be snuffed out and darkness would overtake this world. Something else about salt, salt gives flavor, pizzazz, to everything it touches. Without salt, many foods are, are bland and tasteless. What a distinction for the people of God to be called the salt of the earth. Salt, not pickle juice, by the way. One lady was asked if she would become a Christian, and she said, oh, no, I'm sad enough already. <laughs> Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. I guess that's when salt can contribute to hypertension. <laughs> now, religion will make you look like that. Religion, with its long list, its impossible demands, its legalism and judgmentalism will make you look and act that way. By the way, my spell check says there is no such word as judgmentalism, but there ought to be because I've seen it many, many times. If you're religion, religious, you, just, you deserve your sour look. You have worked hard for it, so keep it. But if you are a Christian, you ought to be known for your Christian love and peace, and joy. Salt adds flavor, zest, and sparkle. You are the salt of the earth. And then salt penetrates. Jesus often used figures of speech, speeches. He used a multiplicity of figures of speech to lead His disciples into an understanding of who they were and what their mission was, and what His mission for them was. He told them they were the salt of the earth, and they were light, the light of the world. He told them that He had given them the keys to the kingdom. He told them that His work was comparable to bread and water and fire. Now, at first, this looks like a disjointed conglomeration of disconnected terminology. The variety of those figures of speech can appear to be bewildering, but a powerful truth and an amazing focus soon emerges. Each figure represents some kind of penetration. The salt penetrates the meat. The light penetrates the darkness. The key penetrates the lock. The bread penetrates the body. The water penetrates the hard crust of the earth. The fire continues only as it continues to penetrate and make its way to new fuel. Penetration is the role of the church. A barrel of salt does no good in the barrel. In fact, salt does no good if it stays in the shaker. It's got to be used. It's got to be spread. It's got to penetrate. 
And some people see the sum total of being a Christian as being a part of the church without seeing their need to penetrate the world. But Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. He didn't say you're the salt of the church. You are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Our assignment is not to withdraw from the world. There's no biblical justification for that. Church groups that do that deprive the world of their witness, and they disobey Christ. Christ said, you are not of the world, but you are in the world. You are the salt of the earth. Some people say, you know, I... I hate my job. I just hate it. I'm the only Christian there. Hello? Wake up call. The Lord, thank God, put you there to be salt and light. You have a special privilege of going into a mission field to represent your Lord. But pastor, you don't understand. It's it's really ugly out there. They are crude and cruel. They use foul language and dirty jokes. Of course they do. That's what sinners do. I pastored in Sioux City and had a lady in the church. Her name was Norma, Norma West. One of my favorite people. Uh, people. And I, Norma, I always considered Norma to be my hit man. Um, hit woman, I I guess. If I had a communication that needed to be shared with someone and I didn't want to do it, I felt uncomfortable doing it, uh, I would ask Norma to go to that person and do it for me. And she was always happy to do it. I knew if I did it, I would offend 30 people. But Norma could do it and never offend anybody. She really had a, a special, a special gift that way. You say, well, pastor, that sounds kind of cowardly. Hey, listen, sheep bite. I don't know if you knew that or not. She told me one time about a co-worker, came up to her and said, hey, I've got a joke for you. Norma said, is it clean? And the co-worker said, no. She said, well, I don't want to hear it. Norma said to that co-worker, I've got a joke for you. The co-worker said, is it clean? She said, well, yes, of course. He said, I don't want to hear it. That is the mentality of the world. That's the way sinners act. But buckle up, soldier. You can show them a better way. Salt creates thirst. So get out there and mingle and touch your fellow workers and your fellow students and touch your neighborhood and let salt do what salt does. And then thirdly, Jesus, let's look at the warning that is delivered in verse 13. He said, it is, um, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You see, the salt with which Christ was familiar was a crude composite found along the shores of the Dead Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. And when it was exposed over a long period of time to rain and air and sun, it would would become insipid. It would lose its flavor. And so then the salt was good for nothing. So they would use it for gravel on the roads. Christ said, thrown out, trampled by men, trodden underfoot. If the salt is washed out of it, if the salt has lost its saltiness, it's lost everything. It's lost its identity and power and purpose. It has become a light that does not shine and a tree that does not bear fruit and salt that has no flavor. So Jesus delivers a warning here, not because He's a meanie, not because He likes to rain on our parade, Whenever Jesus issues a warning, it's always for our good. It's always because we are in danger of losing something. 
And if we don't, if we don't heed his warning, we are in danger of losing our effectiveness, our potential, our fruitfulness. If we don't heed his warning, we lose and the world loses. You are the salt of the earth. Don't lose your saltiness. You are the light of the world. Don't hide under a basket. Now, I believe that even though this appears to be at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, I believe when he gave this teaching that he knew what was around the pike. He knew what was coming at him, rushing toward him. I think he knew that his ministry would be extremely short-lived. Yes, I think he lived under the shadow of the cross, and he knew that his days were numbered. And so, in the context of this short life, what would he do? Did he consider writing a book, a book to be read by all? But he did not write a book. In fact, we have no record of Jesus writing anything except for writing in the sand. Would he lead an army? Well, he certainly had plenty of enthusiastic followers to do that, but, but he led no army. Will he form a political party? And again, people were ready for that, and they wanted that. But Jesus knew the answer could not be found in politics, still can't. And he will refuse the political ambitions of his followers. In fact, he will leave no organization at all. He left a pinch of salt to be scattered throughout society. I have a neighbor that I like very much. He lives directly across the street from me. And before we moved in, we were told that he, he had no interest in religion. Don't bring it up. And I've tried to be a good neighbor and, and a friend and to just, to just be real. And one day he told me, he said, you don't push, do you? And at first, I didn't know what he was talking about. But then it dawned on me. And I said, no, Russell, I'm not going to push you. And after that, he began to bring up church. He began to ask me questions about church. Now, tell me, where is your church located? Uh, when you preach, do you ever use humor? <laughs> Russell's never heard me preach before. A few weeks ago, Carolyn invited him to come to hear me preach, and she told him there would be humor, but he didn't come. But he later said, that doesn't mean I, I won't come. And I told him he could go to our website and check out the service and the sermon there. And just a couple of days after I told him that, he told me, number one, he said, I listened to every bit of the service. He said, number two, the music people seem to be really warm. That's a nice compliment. And then he said, number three, you look like you weigh 220 pounds on the Internet. <laughs> Thank you, Russell. Now, the point is, he got on the computer. He found our website. He watched our service in its entirety. And my prayer is that there will be enough salt in me that it will make him thirsty for him. The one and the only one who's able to save, and he saves to the uttermost. You are the salt of the earth. Let's pray. Wow, Lord, you didn't say that we should try to be or that we could become. 
My God, you declared you are. And we are. We are because you've made us that. We could never make ourselves the salt of the earth. But when your spirit is in us and your grace is upon us, we have become the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So Lord, help us not to be afraid or intimidated by the darkness. Help us not to undermine our status with any kind of negative self-thought or self-accusation. But help us to enter in and receive and enjoy and blossom before others and represent the Christ who called us and sent us and possesses us. Lord, there are rustles all over, all over, everywhere. Neighbors right across the street who are looking and listening, searching. Help us to be salt of the earth. Help us to be the light of the world. Help us to be Christ ambassadors right where we live, in our families, our homes, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, the schoolhouse, everywhere we go to be aware of whose we are and to whom we belong. Christ, you apprehended us. You put your hand upon us. You called us. My Lord, you brought us into your kingdom. You filled us with your spirit. You turned us loose in this world. The salt is going to be scattered from this place throughout our communities. Help us to honor you in the way we live, to stay close to you so we don't lose that saltiness. 